How's everybody today? How was the first days of school? They were good? We're gonna start Sunday school today. Are you excited about that? Yeah, good. Um, what is with all these blankets that are laying on every pew and laying right there in the middle? You don't know? Do you all have blankets at home? Raise your hand if you have one blanket at home. You have a blanket? Raise your hand if you have two blankets in your house. Billy, you don't have two blankets in your house. You have more than that, what if you have three? Four, five, six, 20. No, six? I bet if we all went home today and we counted, we would find out that we have a lot of blankets in our house. And we like blankets, what, what do we do with blankets? Sleep. Sleep with them, you're right. And do you ever cuddle up with them when you're watching a movie? Or if you're chilly, you went outside to play and you came inside and you got just this chill, do you cover up with a blanket? You have seven blankets? Sweet. Um, that are just yours or in the whole house? Two are yours. Yeah. Will you go home and count today? I bet you have more than seven. Do we ever use blankets to build forts? Yeah, have you done that? If you haven't, you need to go home and do that too. That's fun. Um, but what about people that don't have a blanket or don't have an extra blanket? They can maybe only build a fort because they only have one so they can build a small one. But if they had another one, they could build a bigger fort. What do you think about that? There's people like that in our very own community that need blankets. And so a bunch of women from our church put these quilts together. None of the guys helped them. I just don't understand that, but maybe next year the challenge could be for some of the guys to step up and help with it, right? But a bunch of our women put these quilts together. Look how many there are. They're all the way around on all these pews, and we're going to send those over for them to distribute to people that don't have blankets, that need some blankets for their houses and for their beds and to keep warm. It's pretty cool, isn't it? So we're going to bless these, and we're going to have the congregation help us. So if all of you can grab a hold of that one, even if you have to stand up and spread it out, grab a hold of that one. And everybody else, put your hand on a blanket. I'm going to use this baby blanket that's on my pew. And we're going to pray, okay? You guys, you guys uh, repeat after me, okay? The kids, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to help others. Bless these blankets for the good of the people who will receive them. Amen. Thanks, guys. You can head to Sunday school if you're three to fourth grade. Tyler, right there in the red shirt, is going to lead you. Documents and stations and beliefs. Sometimes there's a miscommunication and we complicate the truth and convolute the story. But as far as I recall, I do believe it all comes down to a man dying on a cross, saving the world, rising from the dead, doing what he said he would do. Just being simple-minded, but it's about Jesus and the way, the truth, the life that can change your heart and soul forever. And we need to be reminded, well, it's the power of the blood that brings us to redemption. We can rise above the fall, and the reason for it all comes down to a man dying on a cross, saving the world.
But remember one thing, it all comes down to a man Dying on the cross, saving the world Rising from the dead, doing what he said he would do today and she woke up feeling very ill so let's send her healing thoughts as we hear our scripture now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them so he told them this parable which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp? sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thanks be to God for the gift of scripture. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, open our minds, open our hearts, open our faith to hear what you have for us to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you'll remember that over this past summer, we've heard many different scriptures where there's tension. The Pharisees and Jesus, they're just not meshing where, very well. Jesus keeps challenging them to go deeper into their faith, to live deeper, richer lives, and they're like, whoa, this guy's making us look bad. We don't like him. So they do whatever they can to kind of point out how wrong Jesus is, how the society really shouldn't follow him. And here we are once again. This time, not only is Jesus welcoming people, but he's eating with them. Sinners, welcoming them and eating with them. Now the funny thing is, I turned 40 this week, and in my 40 years, I have never once met a person who has never sinned. Not one. 40 years, not one. And, and so I, I, I thought, well, this is odd because we're certainly good at pointing that out. We're certainly good at you know, pointing the finger and saying how somebody else isn't like us and we're so much better because we're not them and oh, those people, they're just sinners. But I've never met one person who isn't. So I checked out the Webster's Dictionary. What does Webster say about sin? Who's a sinner? A sinner is someone who has done wrong according to religious or moral law. So technically, speeding isn't a sin, it's just illegal, right? Civil law, right? Right. Okay, so religious or moral law? Moral law goes pretty big, as does religious law. And so somebody who does wrong to that is a sinner. Now, clearly, the people aren't getting it. We're not getting it today, nor did they likely get it when Jesus walked the earth. So Jesus pulls out two parables this time, two. One about a lost sheep and one about a lost coin. And, and what do we find in those parables? We find that there's this lost sheep and, and the shepherd of the sheep goes and search for the sheep and then when finds it, lifts it up, puts it on his shoulders, brings it home, announces to all of their friends and neighbors that they've lost the sheep and then celebrates that that sheep has been found. Now what do the sheep and the coin represent in this text? Sinners. Jesus goes out of his way to care for sinners. It's the tax collector, 
the tax collectors, they, they uh, imposed very severe taxes on the people and, and severely took from any money that they had. And they also um, confiscated their property. If for some reason they wanted five coins from them and they could only give them three, they'd confiscate their pop property. And without property in those days, they really didn't have anything. Um, so tax collectors, there's also car thieves, there's also drug lords, there's terrorists and sex offenders. Those are the lost. Those are the sinning people that they're talking about when they look at this scripture. Now today marks the 15th anniversary of that fateful 9-11. And what we remember about that is the fear, the shock, the sadness that each of us felt as we watched these buildings collapse. We think of the people that are in there and knowing that they're not going to be get, getting out and all the firefighters and all the police who went running to it to help and then didn't come out. And what we also remember 15 years later is that that brought us together as a nation. All of us were hurting. All of us were looking for ways to reach out and to help. And we came together and we worked together as neighbors, as friends, as a country. Now, unfortunately, it looks as though we have forgotten that. We've forgotten how to work together, that, that we had this monumental experience that brought everybody together and kind of changed the face of our country, but we've lost that. We've gotten back to taking sides. We've gotten back to pointing fingers and saying horrible things about one another. But perhaps someday we'll get back there. Perhaps someday we'll, we'll say, hey, this isn't working to be a divided nation. Let's find a way to come together and work together. Um, this week has also been tough for Minnesota and for our whole world as Jacob Wetterling's remains have been found. We've all watched and we've heard those terrible stories about what his last moments were in his young 11-year-old life. And we felt the sense of sadness. We felt the anger. In fact, if we haven't felt it, we need to re-examine ourselves because that was a horrible thing that happened and continues to happen. Now, I'll tell you, the very last thing I want to do is stand before you today and say that Danny Heinrich deserves grace. I don't want to do it. I'll share with you that my emotions are very strong. I want Danny Heinrich, I want to kill him. I want to do to him what he did to Jacob. I don't want to find any way to say Danny Heinrich deserves some kind of grace, some kind of love. Those are my emotions. But my faith is much different than my emotions. My faith asks much, much more of me than that. What did Jesus do with sinners? We have to ask that very difficult question of ourselves when we're confronted with people like Danny Heinrich and the emotions that arise from us when we hear that news. What did Jesus do with sinners? You see, there's a huge disconnect between our emotions and our faith. We can't say that all are welcome in our church and then turn somebody away or scoff at somebody and tell them they're not good enough. We can't even say that all lives matter and then hate on people. It's just a disconnect between our emotions and our faith. Our faith might not always make sense. Certainly this week when I thought about that, wow, here I am just wishing the worst on Danny Heinrich and yet I'm professing this belief in this Christ who asks much more of me than that. It doesn't always make sense, but that's why it's called faith. It's called faith because even when it doesn't make sense, even when it hurts to do what Jesus asks us to do, we believe that that's right. And we believe in a God who brought that example before us and called each of us to live like it. God has this relentless search for the lost. Relentlessly, God searches out those who are lost. And God has joy when they are found. That's what the scriptures, not just this one, but many other scriptures tell us. God has joy when the lost are found. Now imagine our world if this became our attitude and our intention. Imagine our world if we lived like Jesus, if we searched out the lost, if we welcomed them home, found them help, and then announced it and celebrated that they too have been given grace, have been given love. This week, there was a man who called the church needing some help. It was a day that I was extremely busy, 
And I came in and I listened to the voicemail, and as I was listening to the voicemail, Katie came into my office and heard it and said, yeah, this guy's called like all morning, four times probably. And I thought, oh, it just got to me. I was, you know, some days you have a good day and you're, you're very good at stopping everything and listening. Other days you just don't have time for it. So when he called back the sixth time, I spoke with him and, and he briefly said, you know, I, I need some help. I've got this emergency that just came up. And I just brushed him off. I said, you know what, I can't help you today. I told him to have a good day and I hung up the phone. The rest of that day, of course, in fact, immediately when I hung up the phone, I thought, whoa. Kim, you didn't even listen to him. You didn't even take time to think that maybe his emergency was really real and he really needed some help. All you thought was, why does he keep bothering me? Go find somebody else to help you. So all day, all day. So it gets to be about 8 o'clock at night, and it's really working on me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what did I do? So I got in the car, and I came back to church, and I found his phone number, and I called him, and I said, you know, if you can meet me tomorrow morning, I'll have a gift card for you. And I listened to his story, and I wished him well when I saw him. And we shook hands, and, and he was profoundly moved by the fact that somebody would finally take the time to listen and to give him something. I didn't do that. I don't get any credit for that, because I didn't do it out of my emotional will. I did it because I felt really bad later. But you know what? That's the kind of stuff. God has a love that will not let us go. So if God will not let me go when I'm being ruthless and mean and just like, you know what, I really don't want to deal with you today. If God still loves me, then should I not still love other people? God doesn't write anyone off. So why should I? Why should we? Amen.